put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Man, obsolete keyboard setup. I mean, absolute identity lock. I mean, Hitman Assassin's Creed. Hitman Absolution Game Review. Diana Burnwood, 47's handler throughout the entire series, commits the cardinal sin of the world of international contract killing. She starts the story with an unwieldy exposition dump. Seriously, why couldn't some of this stuff have been set up in the earlier games? In fact, the one setup that's been there in the other games is completely dropped. Oh, that and you see, you know, betrays the agency's trust and tries to destroy the entire agency, yada yada yada. But really, I think the, the thing they're bothered by is the exposition dump. And so 47 is sent out to kill her. Whether or not he does that, I will not be revealing here. And immediately after the contract, he, or rather during, he finds that Diana was protecting a young girl named Victoria. Now the exact nature of her, but well basically, she was an agency asset, and they were basically grooming her to be a new assassin, a new, perhaps upgraded 47. This is not a spoiler, it's revealed right there, very first mission. And Diana asks 47. Again, not the only way whether she you know, lives or dies through that, lives through it or dies. But she asks 47 to protect Victoria because, I don't know, I guess there was you know, some polling done and people thought that 47 was too much of an anti-hero, so they're giving him, you know, the, the one humanizing thing that you can always do to an anti-hero, give him a you know, female character to drag around and protect. Thankfully, you don't actually, you know, you don't hang around with her for the whole game, but you know, 47 finds some place where she can be safe. Yes, she asks him to protect her, to prevent her from becoming another 47. And he agrees to this, and this is actually... I give the game crap for introducing a female character to humanize 47 more. I like the fact that 47 has some humanity to him, that's always been an interesting aspect of the games to me, and the fact that it's... He, he basically only knows what it's like to be this killer clone, and the idea that he would prevent someone else from becoming that makes sense. He's always had trouble with that, or from the second game onwards anyway, you know, in the second game they explore that he doesn't necessarily like being a contract killer. It's just, it's what he knows how to do. It was who, it's what he was bred to do. And so there's this other person on the way to becoming that, and he could prevent that. And that is genuinely a good idea, if they were going to introduce a female character to humanize him even more. And so he unplugs, as it were, takes out the earpiece and goes out to, yeah, abandons the agency, goes AWOL, and this really ticks off the agency, the new agency head, Travis something or other, 
who rebuilt the agency after Diana destroyed it. And Travis is, as, as I said, understandably ticked off. I don't think it's the fact that 47 betrayed his trust. I think it's really the fact that now he's another one of these characters in fiction who made that really obviously stupid decision of sending the one person to do the job who was likely to not do it. I don't know. I guess the new agency, the rebuilt agency, does not have a lot of contract killers working for it or something. Actually, that is one decent aspect. We find out that they have a bit of a... Not a single character, but a group of characters who make up the wolf character. Pulp Fiction, Harvey Keitel, wolf character. They, they're the ones who go in and clean up when something has gone wrong. And... I'm not going to give away exactly how, but 47 also becomes framed, so the police are looking for him with a vague description of what he looks like. And the... yeah, so he is on the run from the agency and the police. And yeah, that's basically our setup. So this is a bit of a different take on Hitman. Basically, you no longer have a map. Instead, you have this radar which only tracks people. It doesn't show you walls or anything like that. And it doesn't show you if you know, if the person is armed or not, it just tracks people around you. And, yeah, you basically don't really have intel or the like. It's basically, maybe 47 was given some idea of who this, who the guy he's going out for is, and he may already know some stuff about him, and that's pretty much it. There's, yeah. And I gotta get this out of the way immediately. As a stealth game, this is good. As a Hitman game, it's very disappointing. I think the... I've, I've already touched upon it some. This is barely a Hitman game. I, I mean, when I said that there's no map, your reaction if you know this franchise and love it like I do, should have been, WHAT?! That is ridiculous! It, this franchise, the, this game, takes Hitman, the, the Hitman experience, from being that you orchestrated this beautifully intricate assassination where you only take out your target or targets in a way that would not be discovered to yes, sneak around, not really knowing where to go, in a, in a way that is as linear as it is aimless, and then you stumble onto probably a sound assassination. I, I'm not even kidding, I lost count of how many times I just stumbled on to the assassination. Like, I'm just sneaking around. Basically, I think the only way you can do poorly at this game is if you do go in guns blazing. And I'm not even sure that would necessarily... Actually, on the higher difficulty... Fair enough. On the higher difficulty settings, you can't just blast your way through as a turkey. But, yeah. You shouldn't be able to blast your way through. And that's what I'm trying to say here in a Hitman game. And, yeah, it's just... It's not about planning. It's not about... How to explain? Basically, what it used to be was you knew who your target was, where they were, and you you knew what the basic setup, at least, was of the area that you found them in. And then you went around, you observed things, and you were trying to determine what would be the most secretive way. Is there a good sniping spot? Could I plant some explosives? What is... what are the habits of this guy? Is there some point where he is not guarded? What are his weaknesses? From that, 
you would determine, you, you would maybe even try to track guard paths and, and figure out how to best, you know, can I, how can I hide this guy before his guards return? That's what it used to be, and now you're just, you're always sneaking. Everywhere you go, people are watching you, and you have to, yeah, stay hidden constantly. So you don't get a chance to get any kind of footing. You don't get a chance to get an overview and sit and form a plan, and suddenly just, yeah, you're just sneaking around. Suddenly the kill method is in front of you. And it's just, well, okay, I can use this to kill him. And you just wait for the guy to be in the right position, and you kill him. And then you go on to the next level, and that's it. And it's just, it's not Hitman, and I don't really know why they would... Well, yeah, they're, they're trying to... I No, actually, I don't, I don't really know why they would do this. And like I've already said, it... It loses its identity. I have no problem with a stealth game that is focused on sneaking around, where it isn't really about making a plan. I love the Splinter Cell franchise, for example, until, you know, they castrated it with conviction. And that's, it's fine that there are games like that, but Hitman was never that. And there are plenty of games for that. If you want a game like that, go play one of those games, you know, and then enjoy it. I, I play games like that sometimes, but that's not what I want to do when I play Hitman. Hitman and Commandos, and Commandos is dead, are the only two franchises of stealth that I know that really have this kind of, you, you really have to make a plan. There are consequences and it's not, yeah, I, I feel like I've basically gone over that enough. Part of what they're doing here is what Stoner Cell Conviction also did, trying to make it born, because born is popular. Rightly so, I love born. Ironically, the earlier Hitman games were closer to born, because born does plan, born does observe things and form a plan. When you see him take out guys, he's not just a acting completely on instinct. You know, when he wakes up on the boat and, you know, is about to take out that, that the fisherman found him, that's at him acting on instinct. But other than that, he does plan. So, yeah. Now, basically, the... To, to get more into the loss of identity, I could briefly cover the, the way they handle weaponry. It's always been a thing that you can only carry a certain amount of weapons. You, well, it used to be a thing in, in these games anyway, that you couldn't just carry any weapon you found. Now, basically in this, you can carry your trademark silver balls, and indeed, some of the franchise trademarks do remain. You still murder people using your silenced silver bowlers, as well as the fiber wire, which at this point I have to assume is laced with some kind of deadly chemical, because the moment it touches the other person's skin, he, the, the dude's dead. I, I have no idea how that's supposed to work. I, if it was just supposed to knock him out in, you know, a matter of seconds, that I could believe. And it's not even a matter of seconds, it's like, it's within a second. The, touch it, and that's it. But, and, and it's very much not you snapping his neck, because when you snap the neck, it actually does make a sound, and the fiber wire does not, so, yeah. Thankfully now, the fiber wire actually does go directly into dragging the corpse, which is, you know, continually... Hiding bodies is still the old, good old drag and drop. Anyway, yeah, the trademark silver bowlers, the fiber wire, not the sniper in a case, however. Instead, they basically, you, you just, you, you can hide it in, in the suit. I, I guess Hitman's tailor is 
the guy who does the clothing for Jabber's Threepwood as well. But hey, if you're taking out, you know, series trademarks left and right, why not kill two birds with one stone, really? And that's really part of the problem here. You can carry, in fact, you can carry a sniper and a separate rifle, I discovered. You know, this, uh, the rifle can be an assault rifle, uh, submachine gun, and you can now dual wield submachine guns, which is cool enough, if you find two of them, obviously, and they have to be the same. Yeah, assault rifle, submachine gun, or shotgun. And then you can carry silver rollers and then two pistols, which can also be dual wield, again, provided they're the same, provided you have found two. It's not just you find one, then you can dual wield. And you can now reattach and detach the silencer of at least the silver balls. I never really got around to trying other weapons. There are not a lot of silence weapons, at least not that come with silencers in this game. And yeah, you can you can hide all of those. I, I don't know yeah. And yeah that, that covers the weaponry nicely. Let's let's deal with a, a positive aspect just so this doesn't become a complete downer. Instinct mode is a good idea. What it boils down to is you have this meter which you you choose how and when to spend it and it's finite. On the if you play it on the highest difficulty setting, there, there are five difficulty settings and the highest one does not even have an interface. Literally. There's no there's no HUD. Which is we're just seriously badass. You have to, yeah, everything. The only thing you have is the crosshairs. That's that's awesome. And yeah, so so with five difficulty settings, the game does provide a challenge. Whether you're new to the you know help self gaming and Hitman, or if you've played these since the beginning, and on the higher difficulty settings. It's hard to get more of the instinct. In fact, I think of the highest one, it never regenerates. On the others, it you get more by doing, by completing objectives. So if you're not proceeding, if you're not progressing through a level, you're and, and you're spending instinct, it's just gonna run out. And that's what I'm talking about. That's why Hitman is better than Assassin's Creed, because there are consequences. You have to make choices and I should really explain what instinct does. Basically, it provides hints when you you know you get a little question mark, and you choose: Do I want to spend instinct reading that hint, or do I want to save it for something else? It helps. It predicts guard paths, which is pretty Assassin's Creed like, and you know, revelations at least, and it 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 allows you to see enemies through walls, and this might seem unnecessary given that you do have a personal radar, but it it also helps to give a better idea of how exactly they're standing. Yes, you can see what direction they're facing, but it, it can be very, very useful sometimes. And like I said, it does not, the personal radar does not show walls, so you can't tell if they're in the very next room necessarily, or yeah, and it also allows you, when you're using a disguise, to temporarily trick someone with the same, you know, wearing the same clothing. So, you know, it's, it's a colleague of yours and they know who they're working with or they, you know, they can probably tell. So, yeah, if, if you get close to them, if they're looking at you, and especially if they're close to them, they're gradually going to see through your disguise. And by using instinct, Hitman will obscure his face. And I do disagree with how they did this. Basically, he's like, you know, if you've got a cap, he'll like try to cover his face. And, you know, if he's got uh, an earpiece, he'll tr try to pretend to be listening. I feel like, you know, if he's a, like a police officer, he should be doing like this or something. A janitor should be like, or smiling to the, to the just okay. Forty seven doesn't smile, but okay, you you get my point. I think it shouldn't be. I'm trying to hide from you. You know, I'm Dracula. It should be. Yeah, sorry, that was silly. 
it should be, I'm just one of you guys, don't mind me. And yes, so I disagree with the animation choices, but the idea is great. Partially because you can't just overdo this. Say you're going into a room with a ton of guards, and you're dressed up as a guard. If you keep using it, eventually they're going to see through it. I think uh, what I counted was maybe 5 or 10 seconds is what it lasts. So it's literally, well, there's a guy guarding this, you know, there's a guy standing next to this door, but I do have to get through that door. Okay, deep breath and use instinct to pass him. That's how you use it. You do not just go straight past them. And that's a great idea because this franchise has always had a problem with, it's always been social stealth, and when you put on a disguise that allows you to go to the places that you really gotta go, basically in the, in the second and third game, enemies were way too over, you know, over suspicious of you, even if you were wearing a disguise, and if you did anything at all, they would instantly open fire on you. You know, not even tell you, oh, stop that, you know, just instantly open fire on you, which made those games extremely frustrating. And that was one attempt to make it still tense, because if you just put on a disguise and then you can walk around however you want, that's also just way too easy. But in Blood Money, you know, the fourth game, they did basically, yeah, you, you, they're not that suspicious of you when you put on the disguise, and that takes away a lot of the tension. This is the best way to handle it, because the tension is still there, because that instinct is finite, and you do still have to be very wary of where they're looking, but the disguises do work. You can still actually... It's not like in the second game where, you know, you might as well be trying to... to yeah, I mean... If they're going to be that suspicious of their colleagues, why are you even dressing up as their colleagues, almost, you know? So that is a great idea. Now, the... I, another positive enough aspect is that you... There, there are basically unlockables, you know, the game tracks every disguise you've put on, every weapon or item you've picked up in a level, and at the end of a level, but basically, whenever you, at, at the end of a mission, a mission might consist of several levels, maybe like three levels to one mission sometimes, and at the end of that mission, you're told, well, you did get, or on your plays of this mission, you've gotten this item, this item, this weapon, this weapon, but not these other things, and then when you replay it, you can be trying to remember, did I get those things, and, and, you know, looking for, where are they, and so, you know, encouraging replayability, now that, you know, it's no longer that interesting to actually just straight up play. And, yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's a cool enough idea, and actually that does bring me to another positive, which, if you're still with me, this is the one thing to really enjoy about this game, the contract mode. This is not really a multiplayer, and I'm not even sure exactly how a Hitman multiplayer game would work, but basically it's public, you know, you're creating your own contracts and challenging others and playing the contracts of others, and it's play to create. So basically, you choose a mission in the main game. And as far as I can tell, you don't even have to have completed it in single player at first. And almost all of the levels are there. I think the only ones that aren't are the ones that are just you know, so tiny or so short, don't have targets. But anyway, you play one of those levels, you choose who to mark as a target. And you can, you know, anywhere from one to three targets, you choose you, you know, and, and you, you kill them, and when you've killed them, you choose an exit point. And you, you play it exactly how you want. You want to go in guns blazing, blazing? Go ahead. You want to be completely stealthy? Go ahead. And 
the game notices everything you do. So say you use the same disguise throughout. It'll make that one of the conditions for other players. Now, other players don't have to live up to all of these conditions. The only thing that you have to do to complete a contract that someone else has created is to kill the targets and get to the exit. But if you want to earn the most amount of money, and these money are used for upgrading the weapons, you can also buy them, I think, but I think you can also just get the weapons in single player by, you know, replaying levels and such, so yeah. And, yeah, plus, you know, bragging rights. And you, and, and again, it, it shares this, you know, other people can see how much you've earned on a contract. So, the better you do, the closer you stick to it. And this is where, the, this, this is what the entire game should have been like, you know, telling you you have to live up to these and then figuring out a way to live up to those. That's, that's, well, that's Hitman 1, I guess. Hitman 4 was really more like, you know, how do you want to kill this person? And to an extent, so it was 2 and 3, to an extent. Anyway, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, and the moment you've killed or even knocked out a single person, even if it's not a target, there's going to start a contract timer, which counts down the, the extra, the, the time bonus of money you get. So, yeah, again, it makes sense to only kill your targets and to do it as quickly as possible, and again, know where your targets are, have a plan, and execute that plan to, you know, to perfectly. And again, this is Hitman. That's where it actually has the right to call itself Hitman, you know. And, yeah, contract mode is a lot of fun. And basically, this is something that Hitman fans have been doing since, yeah, since, since the game started coming out, telling, you know, challenging others, hey, try to complete the game only using this, or trying to complete the, that, that level only using this gun, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, now you literally can. And you can create competitions over it, see who, you know, can earn the most cash on this contract over the, you know, over like three days, I think, one to three days, and you choose again, you know. And I think that goes for, yes, that, it goes for levels you created as well as contracts other people have created. So, yeah, that's a really great, yeah, the contracts mode is where the, the game is worth. Yeah. Now, on the heels of that, let's, anyway, with that said, the... Getting back to some of the negative, the game took me only 14 hours to complete. Now, I'll grant that that's only 17% total, you know, unlockables and such, but I did complete every single level, and again, I did not blast my way through, I did my best. I tried to, and in fact, I did get quite good scores on all levels, you know, again, comparing to, and that's just way too short. And the ending is rushed and just bad. I'm not going to give away how here, because spoilers, but if, if I remember when I'm making my thoughts on video, I will make it the first thing I say, so you can watch the start of that and know. Yeah. Now, the positive of the... something I haven't made entirely clear yet is when you are playing single player levels, you are told at, you know, you can check at any point in a level how much has, you know, how many points is, have, have my friends earned? How many points, what is the global average for this level and what is my country's average? So you can, you know, the, the better you do the better a chance of raising your own country's average. And that's pretty cool, you know. Nationalism. And, yeah. 
and the and in addition to that, there are these unique upgrades. There are upgrades that you can't get anywhere else in the game. That it, it's all upgrades to your abilities. It's how well you sneak, how well you shoot, stuff like that. You know how well you throw. You know you you can throw knives again, and it's. Yeah, anyway, I'll get more into that, I promise. And basically, the to, to unlock these, you have to earn a certain amount of points in that level. And again, you can look that up. Right at the start of a level, you can look at your briefing and then see how much do I have to make? And what would I unlock? You know, how, is this important to me? Is this an important upgrade for me to get? You know, for, for me personally, yeah. And that's basically, yeah, so, so there's that incentive to do really well. And that's also something they've always struggled with. It's, it's a dilemma of the, of the series because you're supposed to, but at the same time you basically can go around and just shoot up everything. So, yeah, how to properly incentivize the... Now, the this as as I've already made clear, there's there's actual plot to this one, and this has always been something they've struggled with in this series. It's yet another dilemma, and yes, I do love that word, and we will be getting married sometime this summer. The dilemma of how to balance the plot, which without one, a game can feel kind of falling flat. It, it almost feels like a an expansion pack or something. You know, that's that's kind of the thing of, of the expansion pack, the prototypical expansion pack. Well, it didn't really connect to. I, mean, I think one of the worst. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, some some of the worst of of that would be like the the. Jedi Knight slash Dark Forces series where like Mysteries of the Sith and Jedi Academy just barely have any plot and you're just playing through and it's just these levels that don't really connect to the overall you know it doesn't really forward the plot is what I'm saying it's a lot of tiny little missions and yeah it falls kind of flat and on the other hand the the trademark, the, the unique approach of the game where you you have to you, you have the ability to take your time to make a plan. You know, it's plot might say, well, this mission might be more interesting if there's a bomb about to go off. You know, that's a good way to make a good you know plot driven, you know, it it, it makes it feel very important for you to get there in time. But Hitman, the approach is kind of well. You're taking you're taking your time. You're observing. Yeah, it's it's very. It's about trying to. Yeah, trying to figure out how to best execute the plan. How to best manage to take out the targets and only the targets, and in a way that doesn't raise suspicion, so that you can. You know, that is that is the image of. Hitman, when it, when it goes well and when you're really satisfied with, with how you did, is when you're just walking comfortably, slowly, away from where you've just killed your targets and only your targets. And you're not even, you're not even really noticing that people are, you know, people are around you. You're just walking there in your nice Italian suit and no, nobody's the wiser. Nobody has any idea. And you just comfortably stroll over to the, the agency pick up car or what it might be, you know, the, the, the exit point. That is Hitman. And anyway, yes, so to wrap that, this point up, they've always been struggling to balance plot and this unique aspect of carrying out contracts perfectly and this time they fell in. It's way too much plot. The, the plot drives the game forward leaving freedom and the a lot of the replay value completely in the dust. I mean, again, like I've said, it's so linear. You're not 
When, when you're making a plan, the next time you play that level, you might be thinking, well, I already did that. I already sniped everyone. Could I blow that guy up and then maybe get that guy to the... Oh, that would be cool. I'm going to try that. And that's not what you do here. It's... Oh, honestly, sometimes there's really only one kill method. I was so disappointed by that. It's... I'm sorry, am I playing the first game again? That, that... Yeah, it's, it's... It was way back in... When the first game came out, in like 99, 2000, we hadn't seen Hitman before. We hadn't seen this kind of social stealth, hiding and just comfortably strolling around you know, after having committed a kill. So, you know, it was okay that you had to find out just exactly how to kill the person. It, it was, there was enough new. But this is, that was like 12, 13 years ago. You gotta put something more into it. And they, they figured that out even with, even with the second game, which came out in like 2002. They had multiple different, you know, not, not for every mission, no, but Several of them, you have different ways of killing, you know, people. Equally viable, just with, you know, just depending on what you really want. And not necessarily any of them requiring going in guns blazing. Part of the problem also is, I've, I've already mentioned how this is so much about the sneaking. It's basically that when you... When you start a level, you you don't necessarily know where where to go at at all. So you're just you're sneaking around trying to avoid detection. Like I said, you're you're wanted by the police. So yeah, and and they have a vague description of what you look like. So yes, even the police are dangerous here. Where before it was just. Oh crap, there's police here, I gotta be careful not to, you know, I don't want to kill police officers is one thing, and another might be, you know, if I actually do something suspicious here, even if this guy deserves to die, the police might go for me, you know. But now it's just... Yeah, you... you... It's, it's, it's just not very interesting. You're, you're spending too much time sneaking and it gets really repetitive. And what worsens this is that there are far too few targets in this game. Remember how Blood Money again, the fourth game, the, the game immediately prior to this one, it had almost every single level had more than one target. Seriously, some levels you seriously had to worry about. There's... Uh, I, I, I don't really want to give it away, but like, well, okay, for example, it's, it's a pretty early level. The, the opera, the opera house in, in like Paris, maybe, you literally, the two targets are watching each other. So you can't necessarily, you, you're not going to be able to kill one without the other noticing. And that really limits how you, that's, that's badass, that's, that's seriously, and in this half of the time or so, there's only one target. And before I get too much into that, briefly covering, that reminds me, what happened to the international part of the international contract agency, you know, the ICA, we were working for, I don't know, is 47 just so fed up with the TSA that he refuses to fly internationally anymore? This game is entirely set in America, and I agree, Blood Money was pretty much set in America as well. There's just, like, like I said, the one level in Paris, in the Opera House, that's pretty much the entirety of outside of America levels, but it still had interesting, it, it went a bunch of different places in the U.S. This, you start out gloomy, dark, always at night, Chicago, I don't know, I guess the sun never rises over Chicago, apparently. And as, as far as I can tell from this game, the city is entirely slum. You know, you, you can't go very far without, you know, tripping over a strip club or, yeah, a, a homeless guy. So, and the, 
Yeah, and, and in addition to Chicago, you have, I'm not going to give away exactly where it is, but somewhere in the Midwest of the USA. And that's it. That's literally everything. Well, I think, I'm not entirely sure where the very first level with Diana takes place, but that's just one level. And as you may be able to guess from these two, two locations, that's not enough. You, you, you get tired of them. And like I said, Chicago is all gloom. The Midwest, it's all humid and like, yeah. And that's it. Every level of the game is either gloomy or humid. No, nothing else. The, again, Hitman, it's always been international and it's always had a lot of different moods. The first level of the first game is Hong Kong. One of the first levels in this, Chinatown. Ooh, well that's certainly nice and interesting. I'm sorry, but... Okay, I get the whole, you know, Ida's thing and, you know, the... the how can I put this nicely? America isn't the most... I, I'm not saying it's every American, but a lot of Americans aren't that aware of the rest of the world. So maybe they do want a game that is set entirely American, but at least pick some more locations. For the first part, for the first part of the game in Chicago, I felt like I was playing a Kane and Lynch game. And again, I love Kane and Lynch. But, actually, it felt like I was playing Kane Lynch 2, even though Kane Lynch 1 isn't that, yeah. But that's for Kane and Lynch. That's, that, I don't want Hitman to turn into Kane and Lynch. I, I like that I was able to represent these very different moods and very different experiences. Hitman, Kane and Lynch, yeah, those really are their franchises pretty well covered up. They, they used to have that, that. Freedom Fighters game, but then that, the, the, the sequel to that became Cain Lynch, basically, so Cain Lynch won. Anyway, very different games, you know, they're, yeah, so way too few locations and getting back into the sneaking is just so repetitive. You, you spend most of the game just sneaking, just avoiding everybody around you. I, I don't know, I guess he's got agoraphobia now. Hitman never did have the best of childhoods, I guess it's, it's, it makes sense. He has had a lot of traumatic experiences. But please tone it down, is what I'm saying. And then you have how rare these targets are. And it just, the bottom line is, it's too much sneaking and too little payoff. Again, Splinter Cell, a lot of sneaking. You, you spend most of that game sneaking, but what do you do at the end of the sneaking? You get some important government file, or you're killing some international terrorist or something. That's badass. And this is just... And, and a lot of the killing really is trying to protect Victoria. So it doesn't feel... I mean, again, they, they still provide plenty of, you know, bad guys for you to kill, but... You know, the, the actual targets tend to be real bastards, but it's just not enough. Also because, like I said, you stumble right on to the way to kill them. You don't suddenly get a break from all this boring sneaking. It's just, it's more sneaking, and then at the end of it, you get to press a button, and someone dies, and then it's back to sneaking because a lot of the time you have to sneak away from where you were to complete the, the mission. And it doesn't exactly help that the levels are so freaking tiny. I don't, I do, do not know why they did this. The only thing I can figure is that it makes it easier to do contracts in them to, to say, you know, well, it, you know, it's not that big of a level, you know, if I, if they were as big as they were in the fourth or even, you know, the third, yes, people wouldn't be doing that much of contract, I could imagine, but I don't really, I don't see why they had to make it every single level. I don't see why they couldn't just make some and say, you know what, if anyone's going to make a contract out of this, it's going to be a badass contract, you know. 
it, this has always been a game, it, this has always been a series where you had big expansive levels. It was always about exploring, observing. You had a lot of choices. Do I want to go in the front? Do I want to sneak in the back? Do I want... Do I want to do something completely third? And now, it's just, well, there's one path, and it's completely linear, and... Yeah, and the fact that these levels are so tiny really highlights the fact that it's just... It, it makes it feel very gamey. It, it doesn't feel like... It doesn't feel real, which is a real disservice to this highly realistic and credible franchise, you know, killer clones notwithstanding. And I will say that the various targets, the ones of them that are major characters, are actually built up well. It, it uses its time very well. It doesn't spend a lot of time setting up that these are really, you know, tough but it does set them up as that. And then it goes completely anticlimactic when you actually do kill them because it's completely plain. It's almost, almost every single case is this. I'm, I doubt I'm going to be able to remember most of the contracts, you know, the, the, the actual kill methods and the like in a week or two. And considering that I still remember when well, I don't really spend that much time not playing the other games, so... Anyway... <laughs> the games tend to have memorable contracts, is what I'm saying. I will say the characters are memorable. And there's a lot of quirk, and still a lot of humor throughout. Now, the... And it, it actually, it, it comments on some things like police brutality, sex work, there's this, they come in on the war on drugs. There's actually a, a very early level where you're, that they made fun of hippies. And they're, they're, you're basically going through this hippie den and they just, they're, they're growing a ton of weed. And this one guy grabs this big potted plant of marijuana and runs out. He, he slips and falls and gets back up, runs out into the bathroom. Tries to flush the whole thing down the toilet. That's pretty funny. That yeah, I, I don't think you're gonna have much luck with that dude. And and at the same time, it kind of makes sense. He's 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 probably high on weed. And I have no problem with recreational drug use, but weed does kind of slow those mental processes. So he probably doesn't completely realize that that's not gonna work. Now the the settings are nice, and there is. There is atmosphere to the game. Like I said, it's the, the two atmospheres, gloomy or humid, but they are very effective atmospheres. And the, the plot, for all I say about how it drives the game way too much, it is an engaging plot. Every single time there was a cutscene, I shut up and paid attention. And it, it, it is quite cool. You know, the, again, the, the ending notwithstanding. And the, the various twists and yeah, unexpected events work pretty well. It, it's just... I don't know, yeah, you, just, you really get into the plot. And the, the cutscenes are quite nice. Now, when I, when I mention cutscenes and atmosphere, I of course have to talk about the graphics. And as usual, IO sets a new standard. Unbelievably gorgeous graphics. The particle effects, the weather effects, the the detail on faces. Like you can see the individual little amazing. Seeing seeing rain run down 47's face is you you would swear that it's real. And the level of expression, the level of detail. And that's again why it's so unfortunate that the levels are so tiny. I, I realize there's somewhat of a trade-off here because, again, comparing this to, you know, Revelations, Assassin's Creed Revelations came out like, I don't know, maybe half a year, maybe, yeah, not, yeah, maybe, 
I'm pretty sure it was 2012, at least. So both games came out in 2012, and Revelations has nothing on the graphics. I'm not talking about Assassin's Creed 3. I will get to that. It's on my shelf. Don't worry. I have not played that, so I'm not, I'm not at all talking about the graphics of that. But Revelations has nothing on this. And again, it was somewhat of a very expansion pack just to tide us over until they made the real sequel, but still, this game is freaking gorgeous. And the... I, I will say, the, the bit about all the sneaking, and it, it does lead to disguises being optional in this. And that's interesting, because that is some that is freedom, and that is not something we've particularly seen before. In the other Hitman games, it is mainly social stealth. And I am open to the idea that you can now choose whether you want to disguise yourself or whether you want to, you know, hide from everyone and remain in the suit. I think there's actually, like, one of the unlocks is that apparently every single level is supposed to be completed without changing out, out of 47 suit. That's pretty badass, and I'm gonna be trying that. I just, again, I wish that it wouldn't become so linear and see if if what we were talking about was this way you're probably gonna need to disguise this way you're you don't need to disguise but you're gonna need to stick to those walls like a bug you know sure that's fine I I, I might even sometimes choose the sneaking but give us a choice precious sorry and the what was I? I? I suppose I could mention also, um, among the characters, we have this Midwestern arms dealer who's just a real bastard. You just hate this guy. He's kind of the main villain. And it's just... Oh, well, others than maybe Travis, you know. B Blake Dexter is the arms dealer, and you just hate this guy. And it's just... I think it's it's the 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 Caradine. I don't remember which of them it is. I think he's the one who provides the voice. And by the way, Travis is Powers Booth. So yeah, there's talent there. And yeah, that's he's he's a great character. Like the, they do make great characters. They continue to make great characters. And Blake has this huge bodyguard named Sanchez. It's basically Danny Trejo if he inhaled steroids since birth. He's like a hulk and a half tall and muscular. Now, the one thing I really disliked about this, and the, maybe it's a personal thing, apparently in this world, Hitman, that, that word just means clone killer. They keep referring to hit, to 47 as, oh, it's a hitman. I don't know why they don't just go for, like, it's a, you know, a 40 series killer or something. I mean, 47, you have the 48 clones. It, why not just that? I mean, yeah. Now, it's very clear that they did not think we had the patience for a proper Hitman game here, and something you also very much notice, excuse me, is that in spite of it not being a sandbox title, which, excuse me, again, I, I hope they make another one, I hope they go very much away from the direction this is going, and they actually do go for a sandbox because I could totally see that working. Extremely open and like, you can choose. Do you want to go to the, your target's building? Do you want to get, do you want to rent a room across the street from his building and snipe him from there? Do you want to wait until he goes for a ride? Maybe, you know, bomb his car. Do you want to wait for him to go out to a restaurant, poison his food? That could be amazing. But no, it's not a sandbox game. But in spite of that, it's very clear that IO took one look at the success of Assassin's Creed the franchise and said, you want Assassin's Creed? Or oh, we'll give you Assassin's Creed. I already mentioned that the, you know, instinct is somewhat like sense, you know. Again, they did it better. No doubt about that. Because here it actually has, it, it can run out and it has consequences. 
but you also have these, you know, you can do some acrobatics. There are way too few consequences in general. It's, it's very easy to just get out of bad situations. And again, I, it's not supposed to be. You're supposed to give the game your best, and if you don't, well, you fail. That's, that's it. It's supposed to be a challenge. It builds character, like they always say when you get bullied in school and they don't have, have an actual solution. I'm sorry, I'll keep my childhood trauma to myself, at least for this video. And the... You, you can actually blend in in crowds now, which is really impressive because, again, you're in the humid Midwest or you're in the gloomy slums of Chicago. Man, that S took a while to come out. And you're a bald guy. You're a, you're a middle-aged... Well, I don't know how old he is anyway. He's, you're, you're a Caucasian, bald, Italian suit-wearing guy. How do you blend in in those areas wearing that? Keeping in mind that the police are looking for you with a description of you. Vague, yes, but still, bald guy wearing a suit, I think that would raise some suspicion seeing as how that's, you know, yeah, wow. I mean, it barely makes sense in Assassin's Creed, and there he's actually covering his face. You know, the, the, the hood and his clothes aren't that different from the surroundings, especially back in the, fir in the first game when you, you know, the only way you could blend in, you know, in a moving group was by pretending to be, you know, one of the, one of the priests. And I guess nobody ever asks a priest, why are you carrying a sword? I don't think I would either, especially considering how powerful the church was back then. And there, there are probably others. Yeah, you, you've got these, these hiding places, and they're just... They're invisible, is what they are. You pass them without noticing. And again, this is, this is very Assassin's Creed, but Assassin's Creed made the wise decision of making them the same. You see a pile of leaves slash you know, a big, you know, what's it called, hay, see a bunch of hay, you can jump in there, hide. You see a, a bench with, you know, two people out on the side, you can sit there in the middle and be invisible. Here, a ton of them are unique. Like, the first time I, I passed one, I didn't even know what I was looking at. It just suddenly, the use button came up and said, press this, you'll be hiding. What? what? What are you talking about? There's, there aren't really people around me right now, and and yeah, it's like... And, and some of them are like these... Yeah, I, I can make two specific examples without spoiling anything. If you're dressed up as a janitor, there's a mop in one place, and you can use that, and I'm telling you, that one little, you know, circle is gonna be spotless, because he just stands there... Well, it's not a circle, but you get my drift. I'm not good at geometry, okay? So sue me. And the other is, as a cop, you can fake eat a donut. Hey, 47's watching his carbs. You don't get to be the top assassin and the top hitman in the world, you know, munching on donuts all the time. He never actually takes a bite. He just stands there looking off to the side with, you know, holding it to his lips. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that would trick me, but maybe cops aren't as observing as we've been led to believe. That would explain why they don't pick out the bald guy in the Italian suit in a crowd of people not wearing anything, not looking anything like that, when told to look for a bald guy. I'm not sure they actually know that he's wearing an, a, a suit, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going for, you know, baldy and apologizing to his granddaughter for making him late later, okay? Now, the big thing with these hiding spots, in addition to them being invisible, is they are entirely static. And Assassin's Creed also has these moving crowds of people where you can hide. This has nothing like that. There's either you're hiding in a static group of people, you can also hide in, in like large plants, a total of, 
I'm not, I'm not going to give you the exact number, but it barely happens at all in the game. I don't know why they even included it. It's so pointless. When, but to be fair, they've done... I mean, it's, it's like the hiding in a truck of the second game. Or, to be perfectly honest, as much as I praise the first game, jumping in the, in the first game, yeah. I, I'll grant that that wasn't exactly used very much. Now, the, the big thing with the hiding spots, I promise I'm, I'm getting to something positive right after this. The big problem with the, the, the thing with the hiding spots is these did not have to be static. I don't see why they couldn't be mobile. mobile. If you've got a mop, why not use that to your advantage? Gradually move to the top. Again, patience, you know. If you know exactly where you're going and you've got this mop and everyone's looking at it, it hey, they, they could maybe even make it like, hey, why did you put down the mop so you have to use the mop? I mean, if they're going for this incredibly locked down, you know, chained, unlike every single other game in the series, again, not counting the first, chained to what I have to do, killing all, you know, creativity and personal involvement, why not give that and, and say you have to mop from one place to another like that to, to that? That would be more interesting. And the, 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 maybe not a donut, but why not a coffee cup? Why not just, like, you know, grab a coffee cup from the, you know, I don't know what's it called, rec room, I guess, of the, of, of the police station. And, you know, if, if you just got a high somewhere, just pull it out in the middle of nowhere and just stand there and sit. It doesn't even have to be, you know, there has, there does not have to be anything. Who walks up to a cop and says, I don't think you're actually drinking anything. No, no one, okay? No, I don't even think his colleagues would do that, you know. Or maybe you could say that you're, you're, you know, try not to have so much caffeine and you're having withdrawal. So, you, it's, you know, like when people start eating a lot of carrots or something, they're trying to stop smoking, you know. And you could combine this with using these as the items, which I'll get to explaining in a second, because, yeah, that would, that would make sense. And now you're suddenly carrying this thing and either it's, you know, sudden invisibility. Heck, even if you couldn't, even if you had to pick up the mop and then go to another place and then stand still, mopping that same place over and over, that would still be a huge improvement on what they have here. But anyway, yeah, you could you could easily make the mop your item because items can be used for, you know, one-time kills, they could be thrown for distractions, and then you have a real, you know, Conundrum. Yes, I, I like my vocabulary. Thank you very much. Do you want to distract, possibly not being able to retrieve? Do you want to spend it on killing? Because the ten, things tend to break from that, I think. I, I, I don't use it that much. Or do you want this ability to keep being invisible to your colleagues, you know, to, to your supposed colleagues? That would be interesting. But yeah, to, to get into something positive, the items are a great idea. In some of the other games, you can pick up, like, say, a knife or a hammer, and you can use it to kill people. And in this, they're made into single kills, and you can also toss them to create distractions. Where in, in the fourth game, you had an unlimited supply of coins, and that tricked everyone, to tossing a coin. Here, it's more interesting, partially also because the coin, you know, when you throw a little piece of metal, it automatically makes a sound. If you're throwing, let's say it's a, well, let's say it's a brick. If you're throwing a brick and it hits, like, a tree, it might not make that much of a sound, but if it hits a lamp, or if it hits some buckets, you know, so now you're looking for, okay, where can I cause a distraction, you know, and do I need to cause a distraction here, or do I just wait for him to look in the other direction? That's interesting. And I basically believe, at least when it's something like a brick, I mean, I, I don't think I would pick up a brick from the ground and put it inside my, you know, expensive Italian suit. But okay, Hitman is not that picky about that kind of thing, but you could basically do that. It becomes a bit more, 
it's, it's difficult to believe when it's like a big vase that he's apparently carrying the but again Guybrush Threepwood's tailor now the and, and again using them for a single kill means again do, do I want to distract and again possibly losing it if it's a vase it's gonna break when you throw it or do I want to you know yeah do I want to be able to distract or do I want to be able to kill this guy like that. And of course you can also kill without being armed. Let's see, let's go for another negative before I get to some more positives. There are more positives coming. Hmm. I suppose that might actually be more or less the negatives. Sure, going for a positive instead then. You can kill at short range. You can even kill unarmed. I don't know why it took him so long to take up that freaking hand-to-hand -hand combat class, but he finally did it. And yeah, if if you you know and you can you can engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat whether you've been noticed or not. Although it's it can be a little tricky to you know, either engage in it or to actually just straight up try to kill someone if, if yeah, if, if you haven't been spotted. But say you've been spotted and the guy is trying to fire at you and you even, you know, maybe you don't want to shoot him, maybe, you know, whatever, run at him, he's going to start attacking you. And this is again something that they've been not doing forever in this franchise. You know, in the, in the second game, there's, there's the what's it called, pistol whipping kind of thing, where you hit with the, the, the gun butt, but it's, it's, it's a terrible thing in that game. But anyway, here, you and everyone else can do hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the more well-trained your opponent is, the, the tougher that fight's going to be, and the more you have to watch out not to miss a single punch, because if you miss a punch, it's like re real martial arts. If you miss a punch, you're leaving an opening for your opponent, and you do lose health on it, and you know obviously you don't die at the end of it, but you get like knocked out or something, and that's enough. That's that's mission failed. And it's it's a little awkward to learn because they kind of show it's it's a, a QT, you know, quick time event. You it shows you what button you're supposed to hit before, during, and after you're supposed to hit it. So it takes a little while to get into, but once you do, it's a ton of fun. And that's where they do it right, trying to make it more of like, you know, the Bourne franchise. And the... I think that pretty well covers the... And now, yes, the... If you... If you don't engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, let's say you just want to quietly take someone out. There are a lot more options for pushing this. It's not like in the fourth game you could push anyone. You could push people downstairs if you wanted to, or you know, yeah, anywhere. But in this it is specific to where it is. But now you can do it even if the person is, you know, knocked out or dead. You can pull a, a corpse excuse me, to the edge of a cliff and toss them over to hide them, which actually maybe that, some of that was possible in Blood Money, but what I'm saying is it's, it's the easiest to hide corpses in, in this one, and that's what it should be. That's one aspect of the game you do want to be easy, you know. Now anyway, if you grab someone from behind, you can choose to snap their neck a few seconds into it or you can subdue them, and when you subdue them, you have to keep pressing the same button over and over, and you feel the fight of it, the, the same way this, the hand-to-hand -hand combat puts the physical power of 47 at your fingertips, finally. But, I wish that they would make it possible for the enemy to get out of your grip, because I asked my father, who has you know, he was in the military, and he knows some dirty tricks, and he told me there's there's several things you can do to get out of something like that, even if you're lying down. Like, yes, he finally pulls people to the ground immediately instead of, you know, 
them falling to the ground after they've been, you know. So he's hiding them immediately. That's that's a really great thing also. But yeah, so they can't get out, but still. And you get a point penalty if you do if you do kill anyone who isn't a target. And do note, snapping their neck can be heard from you know a couple of yards away. But subduing them, you're just you know you're you're knocking them out by preventing them from taking oxygen, and they're you know they just yeah shut down, and then you can hide them. And that technically costs like a hundred points, but if you hide their body, you get a hundred points. So you know that in that way you haven't lost anything basically. And the point system is also quite smart because. Briefly, before I get into it, I want to talk more about hiding bodies because I can finish that off really quickly. Body containers can now take two bodies, which means that you can hide in them as well. You can take someone out, subduing them or killing them, hide them in a box or a closet, whatever, and then hide yourself in there. Where in Blood Money, it was separate. Either you could hide yourself somewhere or you could hide a body. Now you can hide two bodies, one of them could be yourself. And that's very clever. And you can even peek out without being spotted. So that's, that's a really great addition. Anyway, the point system, it makes a lot of sense to do it this way because 47 is a perfectionist. He would be trying to do his very best. And in fact, the agency might send someone, you know, they might send the so-called saints, the, their version of the wolf character from Pulp Fiction out to, excuse me, out to take care of you if you don't stay very hidden. So, basically, when you, whenever you do something that earns you points or costs you points, you're told. Again, not in the hardest ability settings, so still, if you don't want that, go ahead and play it on Purist. <laughs> and good luck to you. And, yeah, you're, you're told the moment you do something that earns you points, which also makes it easier to get those unlockables. You, you actually are finding out the moment you do something right. And that was, again, that was a big... It was very frustrating in the earlier games when you couldn't see if you were doing something right or something wrong. You couldn't necessarily tell. What you had done wrong, now you're told immediately, you're told like, spot it, negative 1,000 points, you know. Non-target kill, negative, what is that, 350 points, I don't remember exactly, didn't do it that often. And, uh, yes, I, you know, total, crap, what's it called, I don't, I don't speak, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm patting myself on the back here, that's what I'm saying, and, yeah, it's, it's a very clever way of doing it, and you even see if your rating has changed, you know, if you're a sound assassin, if you're a veteran, whatever, by, you know, points. So it's, it's very reinforcing, it's, you're told what you're doing now, you, you can do it, but it's costing you points. What you're doing now, you don't have to do it every single time, it's difficult, but when you do it, you earn a lot of points. And again, you're racing your country's average and you're competing with your friends. You know, you can say, oh, try and beat, try and beat my score. That's just what I'm saying. Now, the... There is also... I've said that some of the new features are quite bad. And there, there is something quite nice as well. They must have recently rewatched Die Hard, and I can't blame them, because they got the idea to give 47 the ability to climb through vents and the like. There's also, you know, it might be a tunnel or whatever, but you can climb through them. It even pulls out the little, you know, what's it called? Yeah, the, the kind of lighter, where you just light it once and then it stays lit. And you can peek out through, you know, either to the side or in front of you. Again, before you climb out, you can tell, is there someone in front of me, are they looking my way, and, you know, climb out. And this makes it very possible to sneak around. Again, not necessarily using a disguise and trying to avoid being seen by anyone. And by the way, it would appear, like I said, that this is very Splinter Cell in 
not that many ways, but in the way of the linear sneaking. And I guess 47 just got really jealous and went ahead and even stole Sam Fisher's, or at least copied it anyway, ability to hide in basically plain sight with the vision of enemies obscured by naturally occurring phenomena. But 47 is not big on the whole darkness thing, so instead he chooses like smoky areas and, you know, like I said, plants. The smoky areas, they're used more, at least. And while you can't cause it yourself, because we wouldn't want the player to be in control, there are a bunch of levels where you, you know, you're going through smoke. There's actually a, a very early level has this sort of almost Max Payne parody where you're literally, you wake up and you're in this burning building and you have to get out. <gasps> where do I go? There's flames of, oh, the windows right there. Okay. And, you know, obviously there's, there's some smoke in that level, you know, because where there's fire, there's smoke. Now, Another problem with the levels is that they are very heavily scripted, especially early on. There's way too much of just, well, then this happens, and then this happens, and you're not, yeah, it's, it's just you're, you're sneaking past, and this exact thing has to happen right then, and, just, and they're also pretty big on big reveals in a lot of the levels where you, you walk like through a door or something and suddenly there's this huge thing, you know, like there's noise and there's a lot of light and there's a lot of activity right on the other side of that door. But I will say those are pretty nice. I just wish they didn't do it all the time. Now with the, yeah, the, the scripted events just, again, they make replayability an issue. It, it's a lot less interesting when it's the exact same thing happening each time. Now, the... Let's see... The, there's a little bit of sci-fi in this, which... I still don't think that's the right way to go for this franchise. And it is in part a revenge story. With, you know, the... Yeah, and... We've seen that before in this franchise, and it doesn't even go as far as recent revenge stories, so yeah, it just didn't really, it's not all that interesting. Now, let me think. I guess that, I already mentioned the acrobatics. It's not Assassin's Creed acrobatics, it's actually kind of Prince of Persia acrobatics with your, and, and in this you're not even climbing for very long at a time, so again, maintain, maintain some credibility there. But basically, yeah, you're climbing on ledges and the like, and the, Blood Money did this some, but this is doing it a bit more, where, yeah, it's very much, you know, you climb out on a ledge and then you climb up to get to, and you're, and you're you know, climbing in and out of windows and stuff like this. And you can also, climb over some stuff, but it's a big problem with that is you can't tell from looking necessarily if you'll be able to, yeah, climb over something from seeing it, yeah. And there is this, the, the, the in Blood Money you had in every level at least one remote explosive. You could buy, if you wanted to, an additional one, and you only had those two. In this, there are remote explosives, but you have to find them in the levels, so they're kind of controlling when you get to use them, and yeah, I, I prefer the blood money, you know, approach, but to be fair, they also just shouldn't keep doing the exact same thing. Now, this is... I've already described the plot, and you probably yourself thought this, I guess IO Interactive just went, you know what, if, if we're not going to get the transporter to be, you know, the, the, one of the fan favorites, seriously, to be Hitman in the movie version of Hitman, we're just going to make our new Hitman game, you know, basically the transporter, yeah. Now, this does have a... 
there, there, there's, yeah, there, there are a couple of things about aiming that I really should get into. There's not really recoil, which is something, you know, Io is infamous for their realistic recoil. And in this, well, basically, if you don't aim, you know, you have to hold down the right mouse button to aim. And if you don't do that, your shot's not going to go where you want it to. You know, he's going to raise the gun and just fire. And, yeah, that's, that's in place of recoil, I, I think. And it's a pretty decent idea. And, and the, you know, holding right, and of course, it does the little zoom in, and he, you know, really aims the gun. That's very common in shooters today. So, and it's decent. It's a good way to do it, you know. And, you finally, somebody finally taught 47 to hold his freaking breath. And it's not only for snipers, even. It's just any weapon, you can, you know, hold down the button, hold your breath, and line up the shot. And obviously, the thing with this is, while you're doing this, you know, you, you may not do it every single time you shoot, for example. Now, you also have this ability called point shooting, and it's a lot like mark and execute in the you know, Spurner's Soul Conviction, but basically it uses instinct and you get to choose exactly where to shoot someone, which I've, I've seen this kind of you know, tag to shoot ability before, but I don't recall seeing the ability to choose exactly where you shoot them. You know, you choose if you're going to shoot them in the head or somewhere else, and it, it shows in a very cinematic way. Uh, how he shoots them, it's, it's, it's quite cool. And you can only do it if you haven't already been seen, so that's very nice. And again, do you want to use instinct on that, you know, or do you want to just shoot them regularly? And something that this series has really needed, and something that was, you know, it was bound to be introduced at this point, a cover system. I, yeah, it's, and it's, it's quite good even. It's, it's used for sneaking. It's, it's very similar in a lot of ways to the cover system of Deus Ex Human Revolution, where you can you know roll unseen from one cover to another. If there you know if there's a hole here and there's cover here and here, roll across there, and you can walk all the way around cover you know with quite ease, and you can you know jump over the cover. But again. Not always, and can't necessarily tell if you can. It's, it's a theme in this game that you can't tell from looking at something. That mop I mentioned earlier, it it looks exactly like the other cleaning products, and those you can't do a thing to. Anyway, yeah, you basically... I was talking about the cover system. It's, and it, it's complete with blind fire, and the... It's, yeah, it's, it's useful for whether you want to shoot, or whether you need to shoot, or whether you are sneaking. And yeah, it's, it's great. I have nothing negative to say about Well, maybe a little bit of negative to say about that. I do wish... Well, okay, actually, it's not really the fact... It's not really a problem with the cover system. It's a problem with... I, th I suppose that's the only alternate title that I wrote. Yes, I, I wrote it. Just a big surprise. Try to contain it. The, the alternate title of Obsolete Keyboard Setup. I think they did this to court the console users. Which I know is a thing these days. But playing this on the PC, it is just ridiculous. I can't... I don't think I've played a single game in the last, in, you know, that, that came out in the last seven years that had this many buttons to remember. And you're literally, you're, you're forgetting what you're supposed to press a bunch of the time, if, especially if you don't do, you know, again, like I said, early on I found myself not using disguises all that much. And when I finally got to using disguise, I was like, wait, what button do I press to? I, yes, they come up on the, you know, on the screen, but it's still like, uh, on my finger, uh, there, there it is. And it's just ridiculous. Okay, with the first game, I know, I praise it way too much, but in that game, they had a great system. You point to what you want to interact with, you right-click, and you use the scrolling wheel 
on the mouse to choose the option. In the second one, they screwed that completely up by instead making it, what was it, like the, you had to press down or something, I don't remember, but it was ridiculous. In this, you have so many keys that do one thing, like that, that thing of, you know, focus, shoot, you know, where, you, yeah, focus your shot, that's one key, it does nothing else. Using, you know, cover, hugging cover, one key, and then it also does this thing of, you know, if you, if you want to jump down, it also does that. In the last level, there's not a spoiler, there was cover right by where I could jump down, so I kept accidentally hugging the freaking cover, completely screwing up my timing, and timing is everything in a stealth game, trying to jump down. You know, it's ridiculous, and it's so easy to fix. I can't believe they didn't just, again, with all their inspiration from Assassin's Creed, why did they not just have a, what's it called, a toggle key in Assassin's Creed, right from the first game, all the way through, as all of the ones I've played, which is every single one, other than, you know, the third one, you just hold down right mouse button, and every, you know, what, what you do with your, yeah, the, the button corresponding to your head changes what it does, the button corresponding to your unarmed hand changes, you know, all of these things, you know, the, yeah, the button corresponding to your legs changes, I can't believe they didn't just do that, you have, you know, when, when you're approaching, when you've just taken someone out, there's one button to drag him, there's one button to to, to take his disguise, and there's one button to pick up his weapon, and by the way, if there's an item nearby, there's one button for that. I can't believe they didn't just have you point to it, or at least, let's say you... Yeah, yeah, just... It's, it's ridiculous. Or why not just have, like, one interact button and when you, you know, let's say you have this body, you ha he has a disguise, he has a weapon, and you might want to drag him. You press your interact key, and then it opens up a scrolling menu. Then you don't have to be looking at it if they're so worried about the camera, which I could imagine. But no, instead you just have to remember all these freaking keys, and there's no way to, you know, I went into, there, there is no simple keyboard setup to, to just switch it over to, you know, so you're just, you, you have to do this. It's ridiculous. I think that might more or less cover it. In the, in, in the contracts mode, there are plenty of upgrades to get, so you'll probably be playing contracts for a while. And I played a little bit of other people's contracts and creating my own. It's a lot of fun. And, you know, depending on who's making it, it can be very challenging. And, again, some people are going to make just fun, you know, contracts. And, yeah, that's part of the enjoyment of it. And you can even write your own little, you know, plot outline of the, you know, why are you killing this guy? Now, the... There are a lot of memorable situations and settings. A again, you, don't, you only have the two different atmospheres, but... In that, they do have a bunch of different, yeah, settings that are pretty cool. That might more or less cover it. The score is grand and very effective. You really do get into the, yeah, the, the story and what's going on. Now, there is some, there is this ability called Fake Surrender, and basically what you do is, you know, if, if you get spotted going into an area you're not supposed to, you have two options. You can calmly leave the premises, which might be enough for them to accept it, or you can hold down X, which is another button which does nothing else. I th actually, wait, that one might have one other option. And again, that's also part of it. When you hold down the instinct button, the Q changes from attack short range. Why they couldn't just have, you know, 
the, 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 when you press attack, whatever you have chosen of a weapon, if you don't already have it out, obviously if you have it out, you're going to attack with it, but if you have it out, and again, who would attack without aiming first? So why not just have it, yeah, you're going you're gonna to draw your weapon, but the third mouse button, you know, the scrolly wheel, is also holster weapon, you know, holster unholster. So why not just have that be the entire thing? And if you want to use your weapon, you also and the attack button engages hand-to-hand -hand combat. It kills short range, you know, all these different things. But no, instead it's Q. And then when you're holding down the instinct button, which is also well, that one should be used for only that, of course. Then Q becomes the point shooting button, so it's ridiculous. But anyway, fake surrender. You pretend to be surrendering, and then you do the born thing of, you know, grabbing the guy, and he becomes your human shield. And from that, you can either continue to use him as a human shield, or you can just knock him out immediately. So again, it's very easy to cover for yourself. If you do get spotted by someone, you lose some points, but fake surrender, or just, you know, straight up... Yeah, there, there are a bunch of different things you can do, but... Yeah. The system for tossing items is pretty good. You and you can toss from behind cover as well. So that's quite nice. Now, I think that does cover everything. So, yeah, the Basically, it has some good stuff to it, and it, if you're not looking for a Hitman game, if you're just looking for a good stealth game, it is a good stealth game. And I, I would still say it gets repetitive with the sneaking, because unlike Splinter Cell, there's a lot of it where you just, like, you're spending so much time just sneaking into where you're it's, it's like Hitman 2 on steroids in that regard. Hitman 2 at least only had a couple of levels where you had no target, where you were just getting from point A to point B without being spotted, preferably without being spotted. This has a ton of them. It's maybe half the levels are you sneaking to the target or sneaking away from the target afterwards, where originally an entire level had a contract you had to get to the target, kill him unseen, get away unseen. And now it's split up into levels, and yeah, it's just so. So yeah, I, I maintain that it's repetitive, and a lot of people are gonna really just be enjoying the what's it called, the the contracts mode. And yeah, if if you get it at all, definitely play the contracts mode because that is a lot of fun. That's where the game really does shine. And yeah, that covers everything, so actually briefly, there is a sort of checkpoint saving and it's kind of awkward. It's, it's again something the games have always struggled with and in this you, just, you find these points on the floor and you can activate it and you lose that progress if you, you know, play it, if you go out back out on the level, but part of it is that these levels are so short that you almost don't need them excuse me, and then at the same time, sometimes you might actually want a save. I, again, Blood Money did it great. You had a limited amount of saves, especially, or, like, if you played it on easy, you had a limited saves, but other than that, you had fewer and fewer saves. And I think the top, the, the hardest difficulty in that either, yeah, I think that had no saves. I think that, yeah, the, the hardest difficulty in this also has no checkpoint saving, but still, the levels were so short, so, yeah. I've rambled on long enough. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.